Welcome along. We're talking sporting lives uh, on our podcast as ever today. And um, I'm delighted to say that joining me is former Leeds Rhino, um, Great Britain, England, Ireland, International, as well as Bradford Bulls and Witness Vikings coach Francis Cummins. Bit of a mouthful, that, but it was a pretty long and successful career, Franny. Yes, yes. I think when you look back... Um you know, and, and you start to look at numbers and games played and things like that. You can, I can certainly look back and be proud because, um, you know, I think it it was something that I always wanted to do. But never, you never think it's going to go as well as it did. And and for someone who got asked at sixteen year, years of age, can you play wing? And my answer was yes. And I've not played wing since I was about six years old. I think uh, I think it did all right. Because you were a bit of a ball handling standoff when you mm. was a younger player, I can see that with the pace that you had and, and uh, steps off both feet and that sort of thing. Good pair of hands. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to think so. I think at the time I did play standoff for Leeds, I had to fill in when I was young. But but I was the, the, it was at the time Leeds had brought some a good young players through for the last three or four years. Graham Allroyd was a year older than me. Um, I think Doug Lawton thought you know he'd put me in the centre. That's what he'd aimed to do. Um, and that's where I played in the academy. Um, so they, they almost converted me, but yeah, not long into it. Um, you know, it, it probably the, I maybe the end of September, just before my 17th birthday, but it was, uh, there was an injury to a winger, uh, can you play wing and we'll put you on the bench. And I went, yeah, I, I can play. Uh, blagging away, but yeah, I, I went and did it and, and, and played quite a lot of my career there. Bit of self confidence. We'll come back to that in a bit, but let's let's go back to the very beginning because uh, from a sporty family, from a big rugby league uh, playing background, was it always going to be league for you? Yeah, I think it was. I think uh, usually back then, what would it have been early eighties? Um, there weren't there weren't really football clubs. They're all rugby league clubs. There was, there's still a lot of rugby league clubs in Dewsbury, but there weren't really football. I did play football for, at school and things like that, and, uh, and found found most sports quite easy, but. Uh, if I had to pick, I had to pick around when I was about 14. I had to pick, you know, just the time. I didn't have time to do everything. Uh, it was always going to be rugby league and, uh, you know, I'd followed in, in my, my dad's and my uncle's and my cousin's footsteps and, and, wanted, and wanted to, you know, pursue. Were you one of those young players who we've seen so much, you see so much over on the local sports field where it was, the game was all about you when you know when you watch you play in your own age groups and that sort of thing where you're playing above your age groups and still you know racing through and scoring hatfuls of tries and catching people's attention uh but possibly possibly i was um i was while i, I, I was strung out i was i was got really tall when i was like 12 or 13 not like you know not physically big but i was taller than others and i could gallop uh, i could run um so I wasn't like physically really dominating, but I could run faster than most people, and and I, and I found my way to the try line. It wasn't until we probably got to about fifteen, I was playing against seventeen year olds. We we started under sixteens team one season, and the, the 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 league seemed to fall to bit. So we had to play. Uh, I was already playing a year above my age then, and we ended up playing two years above, uh, and did all right. And did all right. I think that was the time when Doug Lawton came. Uh, Came and looked at a few games and uh, and they invited me up to to Edinburgh. Well, probably preceded that. David Ward was in charge first, but there was the odd um, the odd scout that came. And there's actually a picture. There's a picture of a, a summer camp, 1990. I think Jason Robinson's on it, who's who a couple of years older than me. Paul Anderson. We were all about. Th- there's about four of us from Dewsbury. We're about 13. They're all about 17, 18. So they look like men, and we look like you know just little boys and. Uh, that was that's when the interest probably started coming from professional clubs. And Dougie Lawton, can you remember what what happened in that process of, of getting the name on the sign on the dotted line for Leeds? Yeah, yeah, I remember the game. Um, we was playing at home in in, in Dewsbury Park. It was against Youth. Um, and it, while I didn't really see him at first, I, I probably I remember scoring the longest try, beating someone going through and scoring on my way. I'll kick the goal and come back. As I'm coming back, I look across and then the long trench coat with Doug Lott. I was like, oh. and then uh, Bag in hand, probably. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember him smoking at the game. But he, uh, he invited uh, us up to Edinley and it was like a week later and we had a good chat. It was very difficult to understand what he was saying. But, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, he was, he was charming. He was funny. Uh, and he, he, you know, he said, "I want, I want to build this club up. I want to start with youth, and I think you, you're going to be really good." And he, 
I'd already supported Leeds, so it was an easy, easy decision for me. And and playing in this, immediately stepped it stepped in and there and playing in the same team as as your on field hero Gary Schofield. Yeah, well, it was it was really strange because uh, obviously I was a Leeds fan, um, a rugby league fan. So there was there was I mean imagine this, I've I've signed for Leeds. I'm an apprentice, so. At the times when we did proper apprentice stuff, cleaning boots and all that, and we were cleaning the ground and putting the the, the posts up at um, you know the training ground and all that kind of thing, and then um, not long into it, they'd seem to have a clear out of older like the old A team, and it, they'd got rid of it, and we had to play a few. But I, I got invited to train with the first team and walk in the old dressing room at Edley, and I'm it's it's a big rectangle. This is a, the door. I'm looking. Left as Alan Tate and going down Kevin Iro or Craig and he's Scoy's in front of me, so I really want to speak to him to embarrass to that. Looking at, as it just kept going, there's probably Richie Ayres on this side. There's the Kiwis were all together on the left hand side. I know where I'm sitting with them. There was no room anyway. There's one spot available in the whole changing room and it's next to Ellery Hanley. I'm thinking, I just stood there as a 16 year old with my bag, looking, thinking, I don't know, I'll, just, I'll get changed standing up. Uh, Ellery was very good. He beckoned me over, um, you know, asked my name, all that, and I sat next to Ollie for the next two seasons. It was, um, it was great. It was great. Which is great to hear that that sort of thing happens. Um, I've spoken to people before where you you hear that thing about you know there's another dressing room down the corridor or you you go, go get changed in physio's room on table land because you're not yeah, yeah. fit to be in first team. So was. Everybody like Ellery, or were, were others a little bit standoffish, or were you welcomed in? No, I was welcomed in. I mean, they probably just looked at this 16 year old scrawny kid as that, well, he's not going to pressure me for a, a position. Um, uh, so, yeah, it, it was fine. You had little bits of all players didn't get on or whatever. I never really saw any of that. Um, I was quiet. I wasn't, I wasn't going in there really loud and saying how it was going to be. I just sat there really and just took everything in and. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, it wasn't, it, you know, at the end of that year, some of the things we achieved went to Wembley. Well, I was only, only a year before I'd played at the school's Yorkshire Cup final at Halifax Rugby Union and there's about 30 people there. And then next thing I'm, I'm in this change room with all these players that are, you know, my heroes. Yeah, and what was it like playing playing for Dougie? I mean, I, I, I do remember once saying to you, I was never in a dressing room with you and I never went to watch you train or anything like that, but just getting to know you a little bit as a person, I can imagine that you would have been a great player to coach because had your coach given you instructions, you might have questioned him, you might have asked him a question or two back, but I can imagine that you went out and gave your level best to try and satisfy your coach's instructions, whether you agreed with them or not. If he said, stick to your touchline, yeah. you stuck to your touchline, whatever. What was what was Dougie like, like that, say, in comparison to... Uh, Dean Lance or yeah, yeah. I Graham think, Murray. I think Dougie's of a of a time when it was. Your stories about Ryan Clough. Your, your stories about you know I, I, I met Stuart Pearce about five years ago, and uh, which was which were great. I love Stuart Pearce as a player, but I really wanted to know what Ryan Clough was like. So I'm thinking he'll have some gems. I'll have to, and I basically asked him, well, what did he, what did he, what was he like? What did he say to you? And he said, oh, I never spoke to me. I'm, oh, you his captain now, you speak to me. Maybe he just didn't think he needed to. Dougie didn't say much. His man management were very good and he had some characters to deal with in there. He was going there, Alan Tate, uh, the Kiwis, especially you start getting a few Kiwis together, it can be a bit Kiwi time. But his man management was very good. I can't, I remember the odd move or calls he had, but it wasn't like... Um, uh, coaching of Daryl Powell or Graham Murray or how probably coaching's done now, it was more of of like a football manager, what you think of a football manager. You have the coaches, which were probably Ellery, as in the fitness stuff we did. Um, but a lot of it was... Yeah, I mean, he had the he had some good players, and a lot of it were off instinct. They had a few directions, but nothing like how we coach now, which is probably not a bad thing in, in ways... Uh, but you weren't overcoached. You you were you were kept in order, and you was give you a common goal. But it wasn't really the odd bits about. I remember more about him. You know, playing we were playing Lee at Edinley, and it was it was covered in snow, and he was 
he said, here, I've got this. Well, what is it? And it was, um, it was the hand warmers of golfers have, you know, there. And he said, strap them on your wrist, that's what you want. See, there's little things like that <laughs> where, that you think more of than actually, oh, this is what you need to do. It was more about speed, um, training, training hard, even though the methods weren't what anything like, but it, it, it was more about that sort of thing than actually keep your shape, hands up, all this kind of stuff. It was more of encouraging you to play on your instinct and that's what he encourages to do I think your chair arm might just be uh, yeah knocking on the desk right. as it were <laughs> um, which is causing a bit of uh, interference on, on sound so apologies folks if, if that came through um, so interesting to, to hear all that about Dougie I, re- I remember watching one of those scrum down programs back in the day and this would have been before you started playing but when you were still you know junior I was on scrum down a lot I was the kids at the back Right. The interviews. I might have actually well, always behind that it. interview. Always behind it. Well, they, they played Widness in a game at Headingley, and I think Dougie was still the Widness coach at the time, so at the back end of that tenure. It was a great game from what I can remember, and Leeds beat Widness. David Stevenson was playing centre alongside, right. probably Scoey was centre or standoff. And I just remember the post-match interview with John Helm, and he said, uh, like, like Yacht Spud out there with Dougie. And that's about all he sort of... Yeah. He, he was a man of few words, wasn't he, really? Yeah, he'd have a story. He'd be able to tell you and tell you stories. I'd talk to the team about stories and this and that, but it wasn't... It, well, it, it certainly wasn't like what coaching is like now. It was more about people and managing and not, not doing this and giving the odd player a bit of licence here or there. Um, maybe there was a lot more went on and he didn't really tell me, but, you know, you think about the odd clip he might have and he had the, the stack. VHS system where he could chop a few clips so he did put the odd clip on but it wasn't like lots of defence lots of attack it, it, that wasn't the way the game was was probably coached then and of course he was in charge when we're skipping on pretty quickly in those early moments here but um, when you do go to Wembley in 1994 youngest player to appear in a Wembley final 17 years and 200 days mm. And therefore, the youngest player to score in a Challenge Cup final, and it's one of those, you know, I'll, I'll never forget. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. So, what you must feel like? Uh, I was sort of behind the goals at one end, and you were racing towards it, um, and we were all screaming you on. And I think Leeds fans at the time genuinely thought that was the day there was a real opportunity to beat Wigan, and, and couldn't quite get it across the line. What was the whole experience like for you? Well, it's a whirlwind. Like I said, 12 months before, I played in the Yorkshire Cup final for the school, which I think they were the second. We, we won it twice, first years and fifth years it was then. So, you know, occasion, all that. I just remember being just, well, full of it. There's things I remember more about. Dougie was excellent. He was excellent. He, he spoke to me before the game and said, you know, this is how he was. He was more on, listen, son, uh, you go out and enjoy every minute. I said, all you need to remember is, you know, what happens today, you'll be playing next week. You know, that was his way of saying, just enjoy yourself. Um, in in the actual changing room, when you're seeing, like, Gary Schofield being nervous, you know, and people like that, and he obviously played at Wembley and he's played the Aussies and all that, but he's Challenge Cup finals, he's not. You see, seeing they're nervous. He, he, he sat there thinking... Up. The, the good thing was I had Graham Allroyd. Graham Allroyd was a year older than me, and Scoey seemed like my granddad. You know, he was what is he 10 or 12 years older than us but he's not you know we didn't have much common but we could sit together and we'd be giggling away or whatever it was uh, and I remember being nervous then uh, I remember the night before where we had to basically be sent to bed we, we, we were at Burnham Beaches I think and we'd we'd played croquet we'd done everything they had offered I remember being on, on the tennis court about nine o'clock I think it was Paul Fletcher who came around the corner and he said what are you doing we're like, well, there's nothing to do. We're like, get to bed. You're playing at Wembley tomorrow. We're playing tennis. You know, got very well. But how do you sleep night, the night before your first Challenge yeah. Cup final at 17? Well, so they sent me to bed, and I had room with Craig, and it's more often than not. And Craig, Craig uh, looked after me very well. Craig had a sweet tooth, so the night before Wembley, eventually go to bed. He's, he's watching TV, and Craig had those sort of eyes you couldn't see if he was actually watching. You know, is he, is he watching? I don't want to. The cat turn TV, and he said, "Are you hungry?" So I'm not always on grace. He said, right, and next thing, room services here, we've got a big slab of cake each. Uh, he, must, he said, oh, I always have cake before I get. So I'm sat there eating cake in bed, 
And he, he mentioned, I think he said, I think um, there's an old four of mine might be playing or something. I'm expecting to play Jason Robinson. They actually dropped it, Jason, didn't they? And Twig and Mile played. And he said, uh, well, he's not as, as straight as this, but he said, don't worry about him, I'll sort him out. And all he did all game was just in his ear. Twig and Mile weren't, the year after, were fantastic, but he weren't fit when he first came. I'm glad he weren't. Um, but that's what he said. He just that sort of stuff. You remember those things. You remember you remember walking the, up the tunnel, which I'd watched, you know, football finals, Challenge Cup finals, and it, it's so it's dark with the real light, piercing light at the top, um, and that's the first time I ever felt sound. Sound eight, eight years. So, so the the talk. Elred spoke to me the day before as well. I said, look, keep your head down. Don't be looking for anyone. Just. Get through the first bit and do exactly what you said, but you physically got hit by the noise of you know. And for years after, simply the best came on. You, you start, you start to get goosebumps, bumps, and you know the feeling of that. Uh, Craig Innes, you referred to him, um, and what a fine player to be playing. Were you outside yeah. him that day? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, post he came, he um, he's a really big rugby agent now and he, he was actually in the country last year he came back with them just exactly the same a bit lesser but he was fantastic for me um, one he was a tough great centre um, taught me a lot um, just a nice bloke as well I think um, you know there's some fa- fantastic people I've met through rugby and he's one of those he's just a gem of a guy but he uh, he looked after me all through that year really because I'm thinking back I'm 17 now I'm I'm what, 12, 12 and a half stone, I'm not heavy, <laughs> you know, they were, certainly won't wing her in from my age, Jim Fallon did that on the other side, but not me, and he, he looked after me, you know, because well, I was good on my feet, I weren't going to run over anyone, it was, uh, you know, there was all two, three stone heavier than me. And he himself, I mean, wasn't the biggest of centres, was he, but um, like a lot of great players, had Super balance, um, you know, it was not an easy man to start when with ball in hand. I'd say he's one of the toughest players I've played played against, and and that because he's he weren't overly big, he weren't Kevin Iroh, but he was he was tough, he was strong, um, and yeah, and then he went on, didn't he? he? Went on in the NRL, won the grand final, and played standoff in the end. But he, uh, you know, he was a great player. So ultimately, that day ended in disappointment. Although you know, a bit of personal triumph for you, but I guess you know it does sully things a bit, doesn't it? When you've you've come out on the wrong end of the result, and and you know, with what fifteen twenty minutes to go, as I say, on the touchline over the on the terraces, the Leeds fans are all thinking this could be it. Yeah, I think I think they they pulled away, didn't they? They were they just. They had the experience of, of winning those games. We had some great players who've done it, but as a team, we put, we didn't do what they'd done. You know, you think of the pack, it was ultimately the Great Britain pack as well, and the club had, by just getting back to Wembley, the club just seemed to come alive again. You know, it was the, the last time since 1978, and it was, you know, it, would, it really, really got the club going again. There was probably more of a relief of just getting there. There was a... While we never spoke about that, you wouldn't do as a professional team. Me, as a 17-year-old, I'm more than happy. I'm playing at Wembley. You know, I, I tease my dad about the first time. You know, my dad, when I was really young, would go with his mates and they'd have the weekend and then then the amateur club started doing trips and I was a bit young for that. And then they stopped as I was probably getting that age. The first time I went to Wembley to the Challenge Cup final, I played in it. Um, and, you know, it's just unbelievable. It's, you know, the, the, the experience I had... Um, looking back now, it's like a different person, but you'd, they'd be more nervous now doing it than then because I remember just remember it being that hot. Whereas playing in the summer, we got we were used to it, but when you had that one hot day, that May day, and it's red hot, I just remember because they said, Look, they're going to kick to you early. This is Ellery the day before, and they walked around the stadium. He said, I'm pretty sure they're going to kick to you early. Sean Edwards is me, and he did. Um, he said, Look, just, just relax, relax. Get an early touch, you'll be fine. Anyway, looking back, it's it's a great catch. If I don't say it myself, the crossfield kick to me, and it's over my shoulder. I've caught the ball, and I'm, I've set off running, and I've made like a 30, 40 meter run. The call, and Gary Connolly tackled me, and my mouth was that dry. Never, and no matter how much I drank for the rest of the game, I just had this dry, dry mouth, my throat, see, I just had no energy, you know it. I was at. I don't know how I got there at the end, you know. I know it was an error by them. I just set off running, and I just remember being just shattered. 
and then that's probably the emotional drain, you know, the emotional of it, all the build up. But uh, Dean Bell um, did tease me about, you know, how he nearly caught me. But I did run from my left hand corner towards the post until the last <laughs> ten metres, and I just veered away from him. But I had, uh, I had no energy left after that one. Uh, that, I mean, that's fr from somebody who's never played professional sport. That is really interesting to hear. And obviously, yes, you were a professional sportsman, but you were only 17. So I guess we can also, it's to be expected that you'd feel like you did during those experiences. But that is also what sets people like you apart from run-of-the-mill sports people in that you somehow found a way to cope with that on the day. And, you know, even though... Um, the team didn't win the match. Certainly nobody could say that you had a bad game by any stretch of the imagination because you didn't. You all played pretty well, didn't you? But yeah. you just couldn't quite get across the line. No, I think, and we'd not beaten Wigan for a while as well. So I think the, the worry were that going to be, you know, it wouldn't be a cakewalk for Wigan. You know, I think that's probably anyone's worry, you know, because they could do that to anyone. Uh, we were gradually getting closer to them, but we could never get... At one point, we're thinking we've got them here. Score in the corner, and we're we're up, we're right in there. They just they just always had another gear. They always had another gear. And I'm probably thinking. I I think of uh, watching Gary Connolly as a young fullback, and I think he dropped his first catch, and I was just hoping not for that. I was just hoping look, just catch that ball, and then whatever comes will come. And you know, obviously, you're gonna do your best anyway. But you need people around you to help you more so when you're that age. The voice of uh, Francis Cummins, former Leeds Rhino, of course, uh, who's taken us through his sporting life today. Now then, um, so 94 was... I can remember get, coming away from Wembley that day and thinking, do you know what, we've not won that game as a, as a Leeds supporter as I was back then, um, but absolutely proud. The lads have given everything they've got. Wigan are a truly great side and, and will be forever on record as one of the great sides that have ever played the 13-a-side code. So to live with them and only lose by, what was it, 8, 10 points, something like that. But then to go back the following year, how much of a disappointment then was that by comparison, 1995? And when you say about running away with it, although it wasn't an absolute thrashing, it was a pretty big winning margin. Yeah, it was. We, we were never in it. Um, it was really strange the year after for a few things. Um, I remember it was the start of the Super League Wars and the ARL, and I think... There was all kinds of things going on. Um, there was players sorting themselves out to either sign ARL or Super League. Wigan had already been sorted out as well. I think it even I remember hearing them say and talking in the in the hotel before about certain things. You know, so it was an unsettled sort of time. Um, Ellery was on his way out. Obviously, another year older. Um, they were all talking about where they were going or what's going on because there was some. You know, there was some. Big, big checks flying around. The, the, you know, it was a real strange time for me when I was still on a kid's contract where really they should have sorted me out before. Um, and there was a little bit of money from News Corporation, not like the, some of these figures that some of they got, but they were offering me still nothing. It just weren't fair. But I, I wasn't going in there because I, I would have played for Leeds for nothing. Uh, it was just a really strange experience compared to the first year. Um, they were even... You know, even even at the time, Wembley was dark. It was I remember like it was sunny as I think of Wembley in the finals. It's always sunny, and these are the Wembley, and it was it was threatened rain. It, it had rained the day before, and it was just dull. It just didn't feel the same thing, it, and, and and probably we had we had probably a better team really, but on paper I just remember Jimmy Laws was playing really well, just because his determination, not through anything we did well we just and Jason Robbins played played really well he skipped a past me once but he skipped inside a couple of times um, and really really were just a class apart but we were just that poor we you know I think we've beaten Wigan that season we beat them in the league at Edinley for the first time and, and it looked like we were going to do something but it just looking back it just seemed like players were more distracted there was things about the trip that I can think, I think of Adrian Morley, Moz is the same age as me, and he he signed after the first Wembley. I remember seeing him at the Wigan Sevens play for the academy; were fantastic. Played against him as a as an amateur, 
Um, but he came on the trip, and uh, I always remember that for that Wembley. I can't remember much about the game now, but I do remember him eating baby sweet corn like corn on the cob because he's. <laughs> I think Neil Armand will pretended to do it and he thought it was and he had about four or five and he sat there, everyone's watching him eating these baby sweet corns like corn of the cob. It's just things that you remember. Yeah. Uh, and probably don't want to remember too much about the game that day because I do remember coming away that that day thinking, I'm really deflated today because oh, I yeah. think we all believed you know, that that was going to be the day. So, I mean, so you've had a really, really encouraging start. You've scored your Wembley try. You are a fixture in the team now on the wing. I mentioned Jim Fallon on the other wing and you mentioned Dougie Lawton. The team starts to break up, Super League comes in, Dougie is on his way and in come Dean Bell, man who couldn't quite catch you at Wembley a couple of years earlier as coach and Hugh McGann. Now Hugh McGann, for those who maybe don't know so much about the Rugby League, in, in the 80s had been a you know, sort of legend of New Zealand Rugby League. He was a golden boot winner, I think the first probably the first New Zealander to win the Golden Boot. He had a fantastic reputation as a player. Dean Bell had obviously forged a fantastic reputation as a player alongside him for New Zealand and with all his exploits for Wigan. I know that there were a, a new combi. I think McGann was the football manager, wasn't he? And, and Dean Bell was appointed as the coach. You would have thought, looking in from the outside, that this is going to go swimmingly. You've got these two great guys who've got great respect for each other. All the players must surely have respect for these two guys for what they've achieved on the field in the game. What went wrong? Well, I think uh, I think that you're right. Everyone did respect them for what they did. I mean, I remember having a couple of posters on. I don't know who gave me them, but I had one of Des Drummond and I had one of Hugh McGann. I didn't really know who Hugh McGann was playing. Um, well, it weren't Roosters then. It had been East, Eastern Suburbs. But I had those on my wall. Um, it was it was strange in, in that people assume that players know how it all works. This is this is me as a coach now speaking to people about the thing that because they've been they've played the game and they've been coached they know how coaching and how people work. I'm not sure either of them did. I thought Dean Bell, Dean Bell with with um with another an, a, a proper coaching almost like um, apprenticeship could have been a great coach. He didn't get that from Hugh McGann. Hugh McGann was there as a, as a football manager. I don't think he was great at that either. And in man management, thought Dean was always really good with me, was, but he, he, Dean, Dean Bell couldn't understand why you know, certain players weren't motivated. When he's the total motivated man ever, he put his body through everything. He, and that's the thing, I think when you're at that sort of level, and Dean was fantastic, immense for, for, for Wigan, um, you know, there's probably I don't know. There's probably someone like Gary Schofield as well. He could be. You could think of well, you just do this. Or I don't think about it. Well, most of us can't do that. You've got to th find out what ticks within the group, and you have to keep changes. And coaching's part of acting as well. You've you've got to play with that. I don't think either of them could do it. Plus, having said that, the club was going through financial difficulties as well. So, whereas Dougie. Um, Dougie probably thought, well, this this might. I mean, I think they're offering Dougie's job around in New Zealand. I think he got that back from a friend, so that's why he was gone. But I think the club was starting to well owe money or not not want to spend any money, and and he spent a lot of money at Dougie. Dean got a team that had broke up because of the ARL and uh, <coughs> Super League war, and there's a lot of good young kids, but. You know, it weren't it weren't the sort of kids who uh, who Alex Ferguson had at Man United. It weren't the class of ninety two. It was, and there was no one else to come in. And and I think with that, um, it was it was difficult. It was difficult for them. It clearly was because um, just avoided relegation in that first season in Super League. They uh, move on. Well, Dean Dean Bell actually stepped down, but stayed within the club for a short period, didn't he? Before going back down to New Zealand, and then in comes the sort of new dawn, really, and uh, and Graham Murray. And now, for all the trophies that Leeds go on to win, most of them, I'm afraid to say, after you retire from playing. But it must be fantastic to have been part of that building process because from the moment he comes in, things feel like they've freshened up. He gives the team uh, a, a more 
cutting edge up front, if you like. He's got a pack that doesn't take a backward step. And he's got some, you know, top quality backs in Wembley follows, grand finals. Mm. Um, and the, the club starts to go in an upward curve and you were, you know, a huge part of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, from from obviously it didn't quite go in admin, but it had the same feeling as when I've been in admin with other clubs. Um, it was players leaving and that stopped. Obviously, um, Carrick and, and Gary Etherington came in as well. Um a few things fell in in the favour, you know. I think Graham Murray was Super League. He signed for Super League. He didn't have a club in 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 Australia, so he, he fell in in Leeds's lap a little bit. Um, he had a couple of players from Newcastle, in Brad Gordon and Mark Glanville, who was you know as tough as teak. Um, as with they could come in and help the, the the younger lads who you know Adrian Morley's now coming of age. Um, and we had, obviously Gary's linked with Sheffield, so there was Ryan Sheridan and the A. Um, there were also Keithley had just gone to the wall, so that's when Gary Darryl stepped Powell. in again. Daryl, that's Fleary. There were a few others who, who didn't quite make the grade, but as we've now got a squad that is building towards other things. They signed Yestin. Now the, the you know things are happening, and I think um, that was probably the start of of culture. Really, it was culture. I think there was you know there was hard work in a different era because. Um, Graham was a fantastic guy. One is he, he expected a lot of you on the training field and playing, but he also expected you to have a good time as well. So he almost insisted, and this was the time when we played Friday nights and we were all out on a Friday night in town. And I, I remember seeing him in Brannigan's and, you know, he, he liked to drink and the lads just just enjoyed each other's company and we had a, a good time as well as playing hard and training very hard I think Edgar Curtis came as a conditioner American who who really revolutionised how how they physically prepared and you know the, the weight lifting the power lifting stuff we did was all new um, nutrition all that kind of st- it just there was just a big step up in the, the professionalism of the club um, you know you think of the young lads who are starting to come through now even even at that age, you were all academy, junior academy, were well, Matt Diskin, Chev Walkers, Nick Scrutons, Rob Burrow, Danny Maguire, Kevin Sip. They're all, I mean, Kev played in the, oh, he didn't play, but he was in part of the 99 squad. So they, they was all part of this new regime and, and this tough regime. And it was, you know, we, uh, some of the stuff we did, the, the, you know, you'd look and laugh now. I mean, you know, we, we trained really hard probably too hard there's other methods of doing it but we trained hard and, and we played hard as well you mentioned 99 let's touch on that well let's probably wind it back first because 98 happens first it's the first ever Super League grand final you're in the team it's Wigan again um, and it's the same result but again that was it was a great game to watch I remember it was you were just on the edge of your seat watching that one This by this time I'm in the press box watching you all do that Never stopped raining at Old Trafford. What was that? What was that experience like? And be, because you'd been there and done a couple of Wembley finals now, so you're getting to be a bit more of an old hand at it. Yeah, uh, you know, I'd have been 22, so 22. I've played in two Wembleys. I've had first ever grand final. We people didn't really know what it was going to be like. We hoped that there'd be a good big crowd there at Old Trafford, which would be great. But they weren't sure what it was going to be like. There was still a lot of well, it shouldn't be, we shouldn't win it like this. We beat Wigan twice that year. Uh, we fully expected to beat them as well. I remember, we remember we invited going to we got invited to the um, Man of Steel and both teams were there. This was like on the Tuesday and the Wigan are, are, are pretty much all guard. They're the old you know old Great Britain squad. They're all having a few beers, and we you know we weren't allowed to drink or all. We're thinking we're going to have these. We're going to get these because we'd already beat them a few. We went to Central Park, which you know I'd never done before, and, and wiped them off. Off the off the park physically, we was outstanding. Um, that might well have been when Moz got, got the elbow in the, in the head. Nick Cassidy, Nick Cassidy yeah. yes. Um, so we, we were full of confidence, uh, and obviously it was just wet. We had a great start. Richie scored. Uh, obviously, Brad Gordon did play. The funny little run up to it, I'd, I'd done my knee against Halifax about three weeks. I think we we got hammered by Halifax, so I went there in the playoffs and smashed them. But I did my knee right at the end. Um, so I remember limping around. I would ju- it was one of those games where I'm just I'm playing the centre. I'm just hoping to get through it because there was no one else. There wasn't. No, I think that, that, that literally was. I think 
Mark Sinclair played on the wing with me and just had nothing left there. But we were totally in charge until Jason Robinson popped up. He just went back on the inside and he, he went straight through the middle. It was a great try, but there was nothing between the two teams. It were goal kicks after that. And it was just, it, yeah, it was, it was one of those that... It would it opened everyone's eyes. I think you sometimes you need need to believe that you can do it, and uh, and sometimes you you need to be there and experience it. Uh, and the the number of players within that team, um, it just kicked them on. You know, I think as people like Dad Flair who had been playing generally, been playing in in the championship, he would not really played top division. With some players, and Anthony Farrell who played at Sheffield, who were, who were a tough team. You know, when I first started, tough, but they were never challenging. And we went there and we did that and it, it just really kicked us on. It really did kick us on. And when you think about the sort of players that you've been mentioning uh, in the side and you put the coach in and among all that, you've told us a bit what Graham was like uh, off the field, but in terms of your preparation for matches and that sort of thing, was he different? Did you feel a, a sort of sea change from what you'd seen in those first few years you'd been there under the other couple of coaches? Yeah, yeah, you did. You um, And while I said... Dougie's my manager, but fantastic. There wasn't lots of, I mean, now there's video of everything, every game's covered and all this. It weren't like that then. You think of all the games being on TV, there weren't. There were. Um, he was more of, uh, yeah, footage, but stats were now coming in. He had, uh, you know, it was probably the first time that I'd bumped into completion rates and he had field position and colours and things you had to do and certain numbers before you're allowed to... You know, first five sets and all this kind of thing, and it, it, yeah, it just it just ed it would education really, as opposed to, I've I've got all the players together, just go and go and play guys that are a bit more than that. Then we had Yestin, didn't we? Yestin, you know, he'd, he'd start full back, go go to stand off, did all that, and I remember I remember even when he, the next year when he started to play six all the time, we played a lot of full back of that year. Yestin didn't know what he was doing, and that's why it was so dangerous. I'm a fullback knowing, well, if I'm going to follow Yestin Harris, or I'm going to follow, well, Barry was another one who used to follow around, but certain situations, no. Um, he just, you're just trying to follow them around. He was just special. It was his time was Yestin. It was just a, probably a shame for the game that he actually went to rugby union when he did. he did. Yeah. So the following season, you say you started to believe you lose that game against Wigan, but the following year, Challenge Cup final win. Now, People look at that and they go, London Broncos, who were they? I know they had Martin Afire and John Edwards, two of the, you know, Martin Afire, one of the legends of the game. Sean Edwards, certainly of the modern era, uh, as part of that team. But you beat them by a record score and everyone thinks that's a doddle and you know, all you had to do was turn up. But actually there were scares on the day and on the way to the final, I mean, you'd beaten everybody there was to beat. Yeah. That you could put all the big teams, Saints, Wigan, Bradford, uh, Bradford yeah. yeah. No, we'd... we'd, we'd we'd lost to Bradford in the previous two semi-finals the first one was was the probably the most devastating one because we'd, we'd hammered Bradford every year um, Brian Smith had gone in and they made some signings but we'd played them in the centenary season and hammered them again and then it was the end of the centenary we were played this semi-final and that was probably the best game they've ever and they just kicked on they were just that far ahead of us really um, but yeah we'd been through I think Barry got sent off in one of them I think we'd beat Wigan Saints, Bradford, I think we were witness with the other one, witness weren't the, the power, but we'd knocked out all the other ones um, and played brilliantly. Like I said, Barry got sent off and did his best to, to, to mess it all up. Um, but we, we got through it and then we got to the final and, and uh, we we wasn't talking about London as, you know, it's going to be easy. We used to talk, we had a big theme about 78, it was the last time they won it and we can be the next ones, and it was all that, and it was focusing on that. There were a few things as well which were a bit different was throughout my years, <clears throat> you'd always had a uh, first round win bonus, and it could change if you played a low club, and it could be a bit more, and then you'd get a little bit more, and it would progress. Gary came in and he, he said, um, if we don't win this, it's not a success, so we can, we can come up with a, a different formula that you can either carry on what you're doing, get your win for every round, or you can get to the final and win. Now, if you get to the final lose, you'll get, I don't know what it was, it might have been a few thousand, or you can get there and win 20,000. It'd be like 20,000. We've never, no one ever got paid 20,000, but um, 
at first, we, yeah, yeah, we're going to do it, we're going to do it. And I'm thinking, oh, we've done a right. Gamble is that, isn't it? But we did, we gambled and it was, uh, and it, it came off. Um, but within the first 20 minutes, um, I, you know, Brad Godden was over this year and we were chatting about it. And the things I remember on the morning, Mark Glanville um, was probably about 34 then. And one of his knees pointed the wrong way. I don't know how he was still playing. It was the toughest teak he was. But he had the biggest break, full cooked, full English breakfast I've ever seen. And gee, what are you doing? Oh, no, I do this every day. Anyway, you were outstanding. But but they actually went between me and Brad Godden. They scored two tries. Or, yeah, two tries early. Um, they also kicked behind us as well. I think Ryan Sheridan saved us twice. If Ryan had got back, they put the ball between us. We couldn't get back. They're going to score. They're going to score two more. He saved his shares. It was fantastic. He, obviously, Leroy went on and scored the, the tries and got the lands told, but shares were the best player on the field, really. Um, and we just we started to get into it eventually. You know, we, we pride ourselves about being fitter than most teams and um, there were probably about, there was more of a, a conference around, we're going to get them, we've just got to stick, but but we were nervy at the start. We was For the first 10, 15 minutes, it weren't till really the start of the second half. We just got back, just got, so we might have just gone ahead or we might have been drawing at half time. We got back into it just before half time. Got back in the change room. It was like, right, we start again now. Um, we go back to the first five sets. We do it and we just got back and, and it just seemed to flow. Then obviously Leroy, Leroy did his thing. Uh, Richie were very good. Um, Yestin started flying and, 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 and things happened. And we just were able to relax. And you ran right in the second half. How was the, um, how was the head on the Sunday morning? Yeah, I, I, like I said, that team, that team was uh, was was very good on the field. It was great off the field as well. I, 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 they they always seem to merge into another year. You remember coming back on the bus, so we, I'm, I'm pretty sure we were straight back on it. So no time for hangovers. The hangovers probably came two or three days later, but that was another one as well. We had to play Saints on the Wednesday, so we've played Saturday. We've had a, a good old skin for and a great night. Sunday is the welcome home, so we're drinking on the way home, we're drinking on the bus, we've got the suit reception, we're drinking all day and all night. Then we had to meet on the, it must have been Monday, it might have been Tuesday, might give us Monday off. We had to meet and basically Graham Murray, we had to play Saints away on the Wednesday and it was like, who wants to play? And it was a bit like, <laughs> when we got hammered, but we, uh, we were still drunk, we were still drunk. Um. So Graham obviously moved on at the end of, that summer, wasn't it, really? Uh, end of that 99 season. Yeah. And in comes Dean Lance, who had been successful as a player for Canberra Raiders. To be honest, uh, and he'd had a couple of um, coaching jobs where the club had finished, hadn't it? Ad Adelaide Rams, I think, Perth yeah. Western Reds. He'd been in charge and then folded. Um, not saying that wasn't a great recommendation because he might have had all the coaching skills in the world, but something didn't quite work there. No, I, 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 hear, I hear about him recommending and people, I think Graham might have even heard back home, there's some good raps, his assistant, his camera is this and that. Um, and like, like today, the, the, I'm not saying they went into it blind because you can go on recommendations. Uh, and his ideas weren't bad early, Just it just become... He had a hard act to follow. I don't think Graham Murray should have moved on. I don't think he wanted to move on at first. He wanted to stay and... Super League money was stopped and what he wanted and all that weren't they weren't willing to pay him um, so it was a funny time uh, but you've now got players who have, have have bought into one way of playing and they're, 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 there's a lot of them at the top of the game and it soon unravelled it unravelled it probably inconsistencies in how he dealt with people was was part of the problem uh, looking back as a coach now it was that it was players thinking this you said one thing, you've done another, you've said this now, and, you know, there was, I think there was all kinds of things. There was the old, um, you know, the stuff with Paul Sterling, there was all that little bit of, you know, not that I ever saw any of it, but it just, it was just a strange time. You know, we were still, we had a real poor start, but we got to the Challenge Cup final, but we had some great players. We just, we just didn't have that, that extra bit, that extra bit of coaching, I think that would have got there. It's probably the best game we played in the Challenge Cup final because we didn't really play that well before. But it kicked us on, 
we did all right, and then they gave him another chance for another year. It just, it just didn't work. And you don't sort of want to be in a Challenge Cup final trying to find some form. You want to be in their peak form on the day. So it didn't quite work, and Daryl Powell then uh, gets the job. That doesn't last too long either, but it leads you to another Challenge Cup final. So all this time, while I said, and I know you'll forgive me for saying that earlier on, but the success came after you'd retired, I know that there were obviously finals, and it was always building towards that, as I did say earlier yeah. on. So you were in finals, you were competing for these big prizes, but... Still, whatever it was, only once during all that time you'd really found that winning formula. It's, it must have been clearly must have been hard to replicate. Ninety nine was that because of changes in the team or because of changes as a coach? Or what was it? Well, I think I think inconsistencies um, affect lots of things. And you think about being successful and being consistently successful. Well, behaviour needs to change. So talent gets you so far, and talent, you know, and I was a coach is. Talent is great and you need talent, but you need a lot more from it. You need to be able to, you need consistency in how you live your life, how your players are, the age of the players. You know, I, I, I mean, Ali Ferguson, again, I get liking married players. Is it, you know, there's a time for players to live a life and the game start to move on. It moves on. I thought Daryl was fantastic. Daryl, they brought Mal in with Daryl, and I'm thinking Daryl probably didn't need Mal at the time, Mal really. Um, Dowell was really good. I thought Dowell were let down by a few of the senior players, and uh, you know they weren't they weren't quite there were there's too many selfish people in there who either done certain things a certain way and wouldn't move on. And Dowell was very good. He was, you know, the Dowell power now at Cass. Dowell weren't far off that then really. You know the ideas he had. You know he's now got a young crop of young kids who are coming through and he's giving them a chance. And we're still getting there. Um, it was just disappointing um, that that group of players, they were saying one thing and doing the other, really. And it weren't massive things. It's not like there was drinking every night or there was living a life that there weren't, but there were. we got to the, the game day and they didn't have the same discipline towards what we were doing as what happened with Graham Murray. The Lance was slightly different because we had good players and they were pulling us out of situations, but they didn't have the discipline to keep doing what we practised. And so another Channel's Cup final defeat. We're probably not going to the Kevin Sinfield, should he or shouldn't he, at um, Cardiff in 2003 again. And Tony Smith turns up at the end of 2003. He's, he's lifted Huddersfield from nothing and nobody um, at, at that point and got them off the ground, if you like, and his reward is to get the big job um, at Headingley. And immediately we start to see changes in personnel um, and then uh, immediately pretty much we start to see success on the field because his first season they are grand final winners but from your point of view this must have been a pretty difficult time because he comes in and suddenly the man who's racked up the most number of consecutive appearances for Leeds you know, one of the most consistent and durable people um, who's played for the club and certainly in the Super League era yourself is sort of not completely out in the cold because you were in and out of the side but it was making you fight harder for your place than you'd possibly had to do before well yeah I think uh, I think there were the sea change um, there were a few things that obviously the, the group weren't far away it was I reckon with a, a tweak here or there it could have could have kicked on there were a few things obviously Shevin Ryan Bailey had that incident in town and end up and all kinds of things that made the culture change that the you know the lads had to ask permission to go out and all this kind of thing um but it was as if the lads had finally had enough the lads who were probably being a bit ill-disciplined or you know well, it'll be all right that they, they were nailed down a bit more and and and, and tony and, and his assistant brian mack were able to do that obviously showing some different things as well we had a big squad compared to the squads they've got now. You're probably talking 30, 31 players, genuine Super League players, whereas now they're probably 10 short of that every club. Um, Tony obviously came in and were, was tough with it, um, and it's exactly what the club needed just because of some of these players just weren't quite there. And, and you know, um, I, while I didn't, I didn't like not getting picked, I was, I was always whatever's best for the club, always best for the team. I think... That was probably, you know, I could accept it if I have to do one, two and three. And if you're not doing one, two and three, you might not be in the team. Right, fine. 
I'll try and do one, two, and three then. You know, and that, that's how it was. And there's a bit of irony in this, and that by this time you've been playing for 10 years pretty much. Um, you've got your testimonial around that time. As I say, you've racked up all these consecutive appearances. You've got an international on one wing in Marcus Bay, and then you've got the, you, if you like, 10 years younger, Mark, Mark Calderwood, the young flyer on the other wing. What Can you remember that conversation where Tony first says to you, first game of the season, I think it was, sorry, Fran, but there's no shirt for you this week? Yeah, well, it happened a few times. So I remember it always seen the back stairs of the, uh, the meeting room, but it was... Well, it was blunt. It was this is it. We've got picture or this. You have to do this um, to get in the team. Um, and I generally, I've generally thought uh, whatever's best for the team, I'll prove you wrong. That's it. I'm a competitor. I want you to, and I did. I got back in, but um, you know, I, I probably weren't as consistent. But um, I always found it because it was straightforward. I could handle it. I, if it was making things up then I think, hang on, it's not right here. Um, so, no, I was more of, well, whatever's best for the team, I'll, I'll prove you wrong, I'll keep working hard, and um, whatever, you know, literally, whatever's best for the team. But as I say, mixed feelings. So you, you've, you've got the professionalism, you've got the, the oomph, if you like, to go out there and prove him wrong. You get back in, you play 19, 20 games in Super League that season, yep. but not either of the playoffs leading up to the grand final, nor... Leeds' first grand final win in 32 no. years, and as the club, the only club you ever played for, to miss out on that that well, first big. And I know you all share it, and you yeah, would have been no. that all the lads in the team, I'm sure, would have would have said, "Look, it's just as much as yours as it is ours." Yeah, I think the difficult part was, you know, I, I've grown up with the ghosts of Edinley, and there's, you know, there's lots of pressure around Edinley, always were, but they hadn't won the, you know, the the championship. I don't know what it was. Probably seventy sixties. It was a long, long time. Seventy two. Yeah. So there was all those pictures, and you wanted to be part of that. My big goal was I wanted to be part of it as well. Um, I did my knee on the last home game of the season, but I probably wouldn't have been picked for the the playoffs. I probably wouldn't have. And in my own mind, I knew where I was. Um, I'm coming out a contract. I'm thinking it's probably going to be either. Um, at, at one stage I'm thinking well, it's, I'm going to have to move on here. I'm going to play somewhere else and, and that's what I'll do um, we play London Broncos last home game and I, I take the ball from scrum get in between them and someone lands on the side no pain but my knee just kept falling inwards so I'm still thinking oh, it's just, just a, I'd obviously I did quite a bit of cartilage out of my left knee um, which started to hinder me a little bit but I'm in the cycle of anti-inflammatory tablets to get me through the game and then I'd have a day or two off and then I'd have to get back on them because of the harder training session and, the, and it, I, I were in that cycle. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd done my knee, um, I remember thinking, all right, it's not too bad, I think. And the physio said, look, it, it's really swollen, we can't do much about it, asking me a few questions. I actually, we had a week off the week after and I, I went back and trained and I, I've then gone in training and it's just, just like just wobbled and gone and uh, I still didn't think it was that bad went to which you know, I don't live far away from it now the hospital and he said oh your ACL's gone it was like I've got two kids at home I'm out of contract in two months what am I do we had a discussion of there was a possibility then and Saints were doing it but Saints were doing it on, on a dodgy way they, there was a possibility to get another contract and coach because I always coach kids I always coach since I was like 17 and I were doing bits with the academy and you know odd bits but I could coach and play and uh, that was an option and then they changed the rules because of what really St Helens have been doing they've been paying players as coaches lots of money but they weren't coaching anyway they stopped it so I I'd had a few conversations about, you know, mate, possibly there was London, there was Cass, and I did my knee and I've got no option now, no option. Anyway, the club came in and they gave me a bit of money to rehab me back. Um, and it was that time that I was able then to, to do a bit more coaching. And effectively that ended, didn't it? Because I think you played, what, two or three games off the bench the following year and then... Yeah. yeah well, that, that, that was... Was it... Was it sad when you call it a draw or because of the injury you had plenty of time to reflect? It wasn't like you, could, you just walked off one game and... That was it. it, it because I'd, I'd been out for five, for five months, I started to play and I played with some of the young lads in the 21s and went to a few places and 
I'd come back in the first team a few times, um, but I always remember, again, I'm in this cycle of anti inflams and painkillers, and it's not what I wanted to do. Um, I remember coming on at Edinley, and I've gone in the centre, and I've gone through, and I'm over the line, and I pass the ball to Mark Calderwood in the right-hand side near the south stand. I'm over the line, I just give him the ball, and I just knew then, I knew then I'm done, I've finished it, I've not got that, I want to score, I, wanna, I just didn't have it. Um, and and then that was it. That's when I had the opportunity to coach, the opportunity to say, well, uh, again, I'm now coming out of contract. Um, I had these other opportunities, and then it was starting to think of part time and this. And I just I remember around the same time, Gary Conley had come back to Edinley. I'm not that ever ever in the class of Gary Conley, but he came back with witness, and and uh, Mark Calderwood was a fantastic player but Mark couldn't sidestep when I could sidestep when I had knees I could sidestep Mark couldn't and he used to move his head he didn't move his legs um, but he's gone through and he's, he's like shimmied and moved his head and Gary fell on the floor and I would just remember being so sad just so sad to Gary to be what 34, 35 might have been older I just remember being so sad seeing it I'm glad for Mark because we won and we, you know, he's got but I just remember looking at it thinking you know I Gary Conley's been this iconic player and, and I just thought I've got an opportunity to end my career. I've played all the top level, I've had a, you know, great innings, I've done really well, I've got an option to coach, which is a passion of mine. I can really sign off the way I want rather than going, you know, I don't know, going to Dewsbury and, and playing out there and uh, I just thought I've got an opportunity just to sign off on my own, my own way. I can just say, right, that's me. Any regrets playing wise? Would you? What would you change if you went back? No, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't regret. I've, I've been so lucky. I've been so lucky to play with some great players, some great people. You know, there's very few you can think of as bad people, or you know, I've, I've probably experienced a bit more in my coaching career than actually my playing career. Um, you know, I had an opportunity to go to Australia. I remember um, Alan Tate rang me one morning, uh, early one morning. It must have been like a, a Monday morning. I'm sure we'd been, and he said, "Look." Man, they were only 18 Manly have, he, he was going to go for a few months he said but I can't because I don't know what he was doing he was into all kinds of things Alan but he said they want you to go for three months just go and train and experience it what do you think and I'm thinking well sounds great to me 18 year old anyway Leeds wouldn't let me go um, which is the right thing I'd, I think in my first year I played 43 games before Christmas I'd played in all like three yep. teams they didn't have enough players so they basically said, oh, no, no, you can't. You, you've got to have an off-season and do all this. It was right. Uh, opportunity to do that would have been nice. But, you know, it, it wasn't the right time. So you mentioned you've got more regrets maybe in your coaching life um, than you did in your, your playing life. Let's let's talk about that um, and those regrets. I mean, the immediate thing I think about when we look at your rugby league coaching career is... It, it seems from the outside that you've had a couple of opportunities, but they ain't been, um, you know, paved with gold, have they? No. Let's be honest about it. Bradford Bulls in a very tricky situation. Witness Vikings, arguably even more tricky when you got that job middle of May. Um, you know, trying to avoid relegation. What you know? What are your thoughts yeah. on that? And um, because. You want an opportunity. If we all want an opportunity to show what we can do. You can clearly do that job. You got a, a track record doing the assisting with Willie Poaching at Headingley before that, which which afforded you the chance to get in there at Bradford Bulls. Worked with Mick Potter for a bit, didn't you, as well in the first yeah, yeah. place. But is it is it just ill luck that those you know bad I, timing on both occasions, as far as you're concerned? Well, possibly, yeah. I think there's there's more than it's it's not about trying. I think. The, the initial initial time, the first year at Bradford, really enjoyed it. And for what we had, we had probably, what, 22, 23 players. We finished ninth. Um, it, was only like, it was only like the last week where we really fell away. We just didn't have the numbers. Um, we, we started to do a lot of things, but admin and other things came in, whereas then, you know, we, we had a good... Pr the next year had a real good pre-season, brought a few players in. And then the admin crept in. Well, you know, the things that happened there was we got players who were pretending to be injured so they didn't want to play in a pre-season friendly. I remember I was playing Cass and we lost 70 points to 10 or something in the pre-season. They'd been told the day before there was players pretending to be injured so they didn't, wouldn't affect the 2P and all that kind of thing. 
um, which was that was starting to become bitter. First year were great, was really good. They give everything they got, and it was really good. You know, we we just didn't have the the, the numbers in depth really. I think a competitor in me is you always want to make something better. Um, the both the situations were different. I think Bradford we didn't have enough players, and the new owners promised them, "Well, you will get this and that," and it was never coming. Um, and there's the there's the PR bit around professional sport. Then there's the actual nuts and bolts and how it actually works, and what you can do as a coach and what you can't do. Um, and then you see another side to the sport. Then that you can get a bit traded off. They can't. It's obviously the coach when. There's more than that. It's about the players, it's about your funding, it's about your facilities, it's everything you've got. Um, so that that was, it was tough really. It was tough because we'd, we'd rode the storm a bit and you thought, right, we can have a go here. If if they're going to back up and say what they're, they're going to do and they're going to bring more players in and they're going to do this and that, and it, it wasn't coming. Looking back, they were telling me one thing and it weren't coming. They were uh, building for something else. And that was under the chairmanship by then of Mark Green, Mark second Green. year? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think while um, Omar and Jerry, the first that they that had come in, and and the problem wasn't for them the first. It was always going to be the off season, so funding anything while you you go in, you've got you know the the, the customers coming in is fights when you hit that off season, and the same up with Mark Green, um, it stops and there's no nothing coming. You're still paying money and uh, and it's tough. And that was there was all kinds of things going on. You know, we're talking about players. We've got players coming in. They should be there, and it's not happening. Then, um, on the back of it, Elliot White had left, which um, it was an agent thing. But I'm, I'm, I, I was, I agreed with Elliot. He needed to move. I was, he was the one who was saying you need to get out of Bradford. You, I don't mean the club. I meant not living in Bradford. Um, John Bateman, John Bateman always a great relationship with John. Uh, he obviously he didn't get on with Omar, but if if you don't get paid, then you don't. But um, you know he he basically got sold to Wigan for exactly the same price of you know what money was owed to the uh, monster trucks, and it was it was just a it was just a tough time that bit losing the one asset. But all you can do is advise the head coach. You can say, look, this is it. Don't do that. But they're in charge and. And that was that was difficult. That was difficult because as part of it as a coach, you don't really want to be dealing with that. You don't want to be saying, "Well, you know, I need paper and for tip sheets. I need internet. I, I need I need white paint for the you know the grounds that are ringing me. They won't pay for any white paint. So I'm having to ring Edinley to say, look, can you lend us some? It was just yeah, it was uh, it was bizarre. Unbelievable. So so you you do your first um, stint in. Uh, in union with Carnegie, then Doncaster, and then you get the opportunity 2018 at, at Widnes Vikings again, and it's another. You know, Dennis Betts has been there now a few years. They've backed yeah. him and backed him and backed him. Results are not going their way. They look, they're staring down the barrel at relegation, um, and they're thinking, right, we've got to make a change. So you get the call again in a tough situation. You're not you're clearly not one to shirk a challenge, but when you look at those two, three seasons or best part thereof as a head coach in Super League, do you feel like you've kind of been sold short? You're an honest sort of guy. I'm sure you'd you'd be the first to look in the mirror and admit if you don't think you'd coached well enough. But have you really been given a proper opportunity to show what you can do as a head coach? Well, it, the situation's difficult and it's stacked against you. You're looking for... And look, I'd been assistant to Dennis, so it was one of those where we're all it together... The move Dennis on I've got now an opportunity do I do it or do I not obviously there's all kinds of things of my loyalty to Dennis and we spoke through it all a lot we get on really well there's no like you know I'm glad he's gone I've got your job it mm -hmm. weren't that it was you know you, you're emotionally attached to a group of players when you invest in a team no matter your assistant or your, your head coach you, you, you're emotionally attached to it you're invested in it and you're thinking well what's the option do someone's going to have to do this. Um, I'm not sure they could have brought anyone in anyway, but you talk to the staff, look, do we do we have a crack at this? We probably know where we are, and really collectively we might know where we're going. We've just got to try and, and try and at least get a little bit of an upturn, um, and we'll then 
he take people on the word of, well, if you can do that, then you have a chance. But it was more of, well, the competitors, let's have a go. Let's have a go and see if we can. And, uh, you know, it, it was tough because, you know, there's some generally some good lads at Witness, and, but they were young. They were very young and they probably weren't ready for Super League. And we knew that. We were always hoping for the best. We needed those senior players to perform and, and they didn't really. Some have pushed on, a few gone to soft and done all right, but we didn't see that as a, a witness. So, uh, phone been ringing again. You've been back at Doncaster night, so you look, is there still another opportunity in, in Rugby League, Super League to come again or are you happy with your lot in uh, Union at the moment? I don't think it'd be right for me to be looking over the fence. It, it, there was a few things happened last time for me to come back. Obviously, Dennis rang, but there was a few things at Doncaster um, whether they were going to fund and do what they were doing and I think it's not for me to look over I think um, what, what I've probably proved for myself I enjoy helping players achieve and get better and uh, I've got an opportunity at Doncaster where we're doing that it's, 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 um, it's, the work is going to come and it'll, it'll turn, it'll upturn I know it will um, I've got a desire to coach I think and, and wherever that will be at the moment I think um the, the positive thing is I can coach both clubs, which gives me more of an opportunity to earn a living um, and do well. Because you know it's it's not it's not been that. there's been times obviously I had a job and um, you know and if people read certain things I'd worry well obviously you're rubbish or you're not this or that and it's not nice when you you've not got the opportunity. I just enjoy enjoy passing on my knowledge and and uh, experience to players and and obviously open to see him take a little bit on and just give it the best shot because the the the, the, the career is so short you know they, they they can go on and do other things afterwards but um you know the, these young men while they make mistakes they also do some remarkable things as well what they what they're able to do with and put the body through is uh, is fantastic best moment of your of your playing career, pulling on a Great Britain shirt, maybe, or one of those Leeds it was, finals. It was certainly proud. It was certainly proud. It was a strange feeling at Great Britain early on because it was dominated by Wigan, and he never really got. He didn't really feel not welcomed, but it it was a club. It was their club. It wasn't mine. I just felt, you know, I had some. I had the tri series were fantastic when we went Australia, New Zealand. Um, I played New Zealand over here. It was a proud moment for me. I'd always say Great Britain was something I always wanted to achieve. Never really thought I would, but did. Um, played it, no, I knew I wasn't the best in there, but it, it was fantastic. I think for Leeds, was, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd been brought up watching Challenge Cup final, seeing Wigan win all the time. I remember seeing Halifax, maybe Cass, um, Cass and OKR final, uh, but it was all Wigan. And I, just, I just wanted us to... to Challenge Cup and I wanted at least to win what what is now the grand final. Um, I've been happy that I've, I've been part of building that culture and then that's something I'm really proud of. Seeing the club achieve is is, a, is outstanding. Um, most because you know what what it takes and to do it consistently. It's um, it's huge, it's huge, and to be part of it in a small piece is is really really good. Yeah, um, in a coaching capacity, of course, during those uh, grand final wins, what uh, best player you played? With most complete, oh, the the game changes um changes quite quickly. I think um, toughest toughest is is a few. Obviously, there's different positions. I think Ellery Hanley was was immense uh, as a thirty four year old, and he wasn't big then. He was bigger when he was at Wigan. Uh, he took some hammer in that, but he scored forty odd tries. Um, the day before the semi, he won full on into the post, knocked himself out at Edinley, um, which obviously don't get reported, but he then goes and scores the two tries to, to, to get us to Wembley, and he was something else. Uh, Rob Burrow is arguably pound for pound the hardest man ever, just because of his stature. Obviously, he's news now, but um, what he's had to go through. I remember seeing Rob the first time, like a summer school thing, and the first team trained with them, um, and I remembered him because he was that tiny. He was that tiny. Even when he came into the academy and came on onto a, a tour with his uh, what, pre-season tour to America, thinking the game was big then. Thinking of Joe Vergara, Paul Anderson, props. It slimmed down the game now, and but he's just thinking, I don't know, he's gonna gonna hold up, and he's been fantastic. So I think he's probably the the hardest 
rugby league player. Yeah, and and of course he's got a, a fight of his own now to fight, which is terrible news. And, and I'm sure we both wish him um, all the positives in the world to to have to deal with his um, diagnosis with motor neuron disease. Um, coaches, who are your fave? Not necessarily your best. Who did you really like working with? Go on, give us. Well, that. Dougie was the best for stories, and you know he. You could only understand part of his, you know, his banter. You'd hear little bits, and uh, he always had a saying or something. He was, well, I look back now and smile. Even you know, early on, we uh, we at Edinley and me and my dad in his office and all that kind of thing. I think he was probably the funniest. Um, the best Tony Smith's been being a great coach. I think he he really did transform it. Graham Murray transformed Edinley again. Um, They've probably been the, the biggest influences on, on my career and I think along teams that I've been involved in. I have some strange ones, you know, with Great Britain and, you know, a few of those. There's been a few, um, you know, Clive, Clive Griffiths, who I'm actually working with now, is probably one of the most colourful characters I've, I've been involved in uh, with. Um, he's probably more of an old school, though he's 65 years old, he's going to be, but... Um, He's another character. He's not quite up there with Dougie, but he's still got his quirks. And uh, but generally, I think those two. I think uh, Brian Mack. Brian Mack was um, while when I retired, I was in the same office as Mack. Uh, so uh, you know, having his folk music pumping out and all that, it was uh, it was an experience. An experience about canoeing and all this kind of stuff. It was uh, so he's a, he's a character. He's certainly a character. And finally, um, you you're a coach of a whichever team you want to name in rugby league and the chairman walks in with a checkbook throws it on the table and says it's blank you can sign one player from any time in your playing career or life watching rugby league who Ooh, that's a difficult one I think um, well there's one knocking around now Sonny Bill which I think you would have taken if you could have got him 10 years ago he's just the ultimate player I think um my favourite, obviously, Ellery at his time. Ellery would be the best player in any era. He would, just would be. That's just the nature of him. He's not particularly a team player, um, but he would be world-class in any any era because he just had that drive. I, I was really, really pleased that I went and I got to sit next to him because I used to train with him then because I could run. He'd make me run with him, you know, so I think he's special. He's got that bit of... He's just that, that magic dust, I think. He's just, you know, while he weren't the best passer and they didn't have the great kicking game, he just, he's just tough and, and I think he, he would probably be. I think obviously Sonny Bill in this, this era has been something else in any code. He's just, uh, he's just, uh, he's got everything really. Uh, talking of magic dust, you had a bit of that yourself. 356 matches, 188 tries. Francis Cummins, it's been great to, to listen to you about your views on rugby league and, and your career. And many thanks for your time. Thanks, Jonathan.